Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benito. Today I have with me two of our instructors, one of our newer instructors, one of our classic old school, old time instructors, Jeff Smith, and joined with us, joining us today is Tom Stilson. Um, Tom is going to be doing a course on shooting involved before, during, after, all that shit. And they wanted to jump on here and do a podcast that they have a lot to offer this episode. So we'll see what they have to say. So without further ado, hello, Jeffrey. What's AKA happening? Smitty. You don't like you my nickname. Because, you know what? Because you want me to call you Smitty, I won't. You'll just That's, rally against it till you die. No, no, no. I'm just, it's, it's, it's my inherent nature to want to break balls. Yeah, I know. I know. Like, so my wife. I know, I have, I know your I type well. Yeah. My <laughs> wife. <laughs> she could divorce from one. <laughs> uh, my wife uh, said, Oh, this is annoying. You have a, uh, an iPhone now because it rings like mine. And the sound when the text message comes through sounds the same as mine, too. This is driving me nuts. And I was going to change it about 30 minutes before she said that. I was like, let me change it. I was going to do it right after. And then she said that. And I said, now I'm going to leave it just to be a fucking pain in the ass. No, just let me send you. A, let me send you an audio file of me saying, Dennis, Dennis. And that can be your ringtone. That were really well, just continue to break chops. Yeah. Anyway, Thomas. What's going on? How are you? I'm doing good. Living paradise, you know? Here's my first question for you. When did you develop such a keen talent for making funny memes? Oh, dear God. We're going to start how I got started <laughs> here. You know, I it started in college. So you were making geez. memes in college. How old are you, dude? Uh, 30, almost 35. You were making so. memes in college in 30. 30- 15 years ago? So yeah. it started with us doing a scavenger hunt uh, my freshman year in college, and we had to take photographs of any of the shit that we did. And one of the things that they said, if you can add a funny caption to it um, to make it funnier, just go ahead and, and do that. So I was like, oh, I can add some some fucked up stuff to this. And the you're, meme, you're, pretty, uh, you're pretty twisted, my friend. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, when, uh, when I start off your, uh, my meme collection with Pornhub memes of you and Kenny in the car. The uh, best. The yeah. best. <laughs> well, there was a picture that was sent to me recently from one of our new journalists. That was a good oh, one. oh, that, you mean the one in my compromising position? That's how I normally get promotion promotions in my life. So, oh, yeah, it looks. I mean, it got my wheels turning a little bit. Thinking, <laughs> how come I've never gotten anything like that from anybody? You've never asked. <laughs> Let's put it on the record now. Next time I see you, <laughs> I, I would appreciate it if you made me feel good. You know what I mean? Don't we all exist to make you feel good? Isn't that our purpose in life? I think I, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's the I think I hear I'm here to serve all of you. I don't know. I think when we get off the phone together, I usually have a inferior inferiority inferiority complex after we are on the phone a little bit. It's because your ego was big when you came on. You met a bigger dog than yourself. It's always good to meet a bigger dog than yourself. You're for the brother. I, you're I, the I, biggest like, smartest guy in the room. You're in the wrong room. Unless you're Jeff Bezos. If you're Jeff Bezos, you're always yeah. the smartest guy in the room. Right. right. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, honestly, dude, I know people come up and they say things like, oh, my God, appreciate it. Like, I get fucked. I know people are nervous at times. That's how I get when I see Gary Vaynerchuk, right? And I've got to meet him four or five times now and or anybody that I really admire who's uh, had impact on my life. So I'm very, I actually said this to Becca right before I came into the podcast uh, studio to do this podcast with you guys. We talked about humility and ego. And I said, um, I learned a lot about that from the people that I admire, that I was nervous to meet, and they made me feel like I was their best friend every time I met them and that they were no different than me. So that was a real good life lesson for me, especially because there are moments where people are very appreciative of the work that we're doing, and it's important work, and they get excited when they get to see the person. Maybe they're subscribing to the podcast, whatever it may be, and it's an honor. It's a real it's a real pleasure that people think that I'm doing something special well enough where they'd want to take a selfie with me and yeah. uh, it's always welcome. You know what I mean? So, but like having a lot of humility with that and believe me, I know that there are people who know a lot more about a lot of things than I do. Uh, I'm just doing my thing and I'm love breaking your chops, Jeff Smith. I know you do. I, I, yeah, I, like, I enjoy literally. allowing you to do it. I just, just enjoyable. I mean, he comes to the office folks and um, it is literally the roast of Jeff Smith. The minute he walks or limps through the door. He's just, you're just thankful to have somebody older than you in the office. That's what it is. Well, I got Tom too. I got Tom Walsh yeah. here. So he's, 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 he's up there. He's in his late forties. It's anyway. the art of the roast. I mean, if you don't know how to be able to roast somebody as good as you can roast yourself, then I don't think you have enough humility in your life. 
I'm working on making myself less roastable, but I enjoy a good roast. And a uh, matter of fact, there's nothing that tickles me a little bit more or more than people poking fun and, and, and breaking my chops. I think it's just, it's just dandy. And just, just so you know, the harder you work at it, the more material you give out. Bingo. Fair enough. So what are we talking about today, fellas? I thought it'd be good to have Tom on because um, you don't, you, we, there's a lot of cops involved in shootings out there these days. And, um, you know, just from my angle, we don't focus on the devils in the details enough in law enforcement. Sometimes, sometimes we just have that, let's buckle up our chin strap and get out there and get after it kind of mentality without really understanding the process and the science behind the way we prepare and what's going to happen to us and what will happen to us even after a critical incident, whether it's a shooting or a, some other type of critical incident. I don't think we sometimes pay enough attention to that. We like to, you know, you know, brutally honest, we like to act like we do, but sometimes we just don't. And Tom's got some good insight into that. So I thought it'd be good to get him out here. And I think his class is going to be a real good class for people to get into. Give us some context of why you're qualified to speak about this. Tell us about, if you can, whatever details you can of the incident yeah. involved in. Yeah. Um, I mean, both of them have been adjudicated. So uh, I started my law enforcement career in 2015, uh, took kind of a, a different route. And I know, Dennis, you've roasted me about where uh, my background started. Uh, I was a college educated guy, uh, went to uh, kind of the Ivy League of the West Coast at Stanford. Um, but, uh, public service and, and law enforcement was something that I'd always wanted to get into. Um, but it was just, wasn't the right timing. So I went into hard sciences. I worked in geology. I did the, the, um, the nerdy shit. Um, you know, you, if you ever want to talk about plate tectonics or whatever, uh, like they say on uh, big bang theory, uh, I'm a rock monkey. So, um, I, yeah, I, yeah, good news. <laughs> um, I'm not going to want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't matter of fact, you gave to. me like agita thinking about my fucking seventh grade science class and like how I was completely checked out. You're not wanting to self harm though, are you? I just want to make sure of that. Uh, I'm not driving you to that point yet. during the day. Yeah, sometimes it crosses <laughs> my mind. So, uh, but you know, um, as time went on, uh, you know, life happens. I was involved in a serious car wreck, uh, got injured during that, and uh, life just took a turn and uh, moved back to the Midwest. Uh, Went to law enforcement academy and uh, started my first cop job in 2015. I was in my first officer involved shooting in 2017, uh, where uh, me and my partner were ambushed uh, from a homicide suspect uh, to it all kicked off with a domestic. Um, went through that, joined my second agency, uh, was involved in a, uh, for lack of a better term, second critical incident. Um, uh, where I was one of the responding officers where we had one officer shot and killed and another one wounded, uh, due to a roving active shooter. Uh, Dennis, you've had yeah. one of those, you had the officer on, on that one. He's a good friend of mine of ours. Yeah. And yeah. Josiah. And, uh, uh, like what a, what a kid, by the way, like, Oh man, I, you know, dude's a fucking beast. You wouldn't look at him and think that, but he's mentally, he's on a different level. No, yeah. I mean, he's a well, fighter well, for well, sure. It's funny. I think I told you when I met him in Academy, uh, I was like, man, this kid just seems arrogant. And it wasn't that he's arrogant. It's just how he is. He's confident. And, you know, some people project that about him, but I, I love working with him. Um, going on from that in uh, late 2020, um, I was involved in my second officer involved shooting. Uh, we had a, a, an officer. He's just by involved a in another shooting, wasn't he? Yeah. Just I, uh, in, right before Christmas. Yeah. Right before Christmas. I was on vacation with my, uh, uh, grandparents down in texas and i get a phone call from him at like 2 30 in the morning bro i just was in a fucking shooting what do i do <laughs> so you know it's uh and that wasn't the first time i've had that phone call um you know we can look at everything that we do in our life and our experiences and we can look at them as good and bad um and we can try and summarize it as that much or we can look at and this is something i talk about extensively in my class we can look at our experiences as a growth opportunity um, even some of the most awful shit that we could possibly go through in our career, um, dead kids, uh, child sex abuse cases, um, homicides involving, um, legitimate, innocent victims, um, officer involved shootings where an officer is hurt or killed, uh, these sort of awful incidents, there's still some kind of value that we need to find in those and that we can find in those, um, and this class was born largely of that. Um, I, I've trained extensively with, uh, you know, Masad Ayub and um, uh, taken my approach as well, my experience from uh, my time in uh, 
hard sciences and tried to apply that to law enforcement and look at what we do in um, every single call for service, what we do with our uh, uh, day-to-day operations and how we can go through and we can improve what we do uh, every single day to make sure that guys are coming home safe, we're making the right decisions and people aren't getting hurt or killed that don't need to get hurt or killed. So that's been, uh, yeah, I'd say that's a pretty important stuff, right? And everybody wants, it's so interesting. Life is life in general. Um, People tend to want to wait till something happens to find a solution then, but we can predict a lot of the things that are going to occur and say, well, let's prepare for when it does happen. But law enforcement agencies, we don't need that yet, right? Uh, I would see things before they happen. I would say to people in our command staff, hey, I think that we should have, I remember saying this one time, and I probably brought it up in the podcast before, again, often falling on deaf ears. I went to Home Depot. I saw this collapsible ladder. I said, well, that's nifty. And that thing could fit in the back of a patrol car, or I'm sorry, in the back of a supervisor's truck, certainly a patrol car, but you know, it got tight in the trunk. Of the, of the crown vix right so i uh had said you know it's often that we have a medical emergency and we can get through a window but we gotta wait for fire to get there and it takes some more places we were all volunteer only 15 20 minutes for these volunteers to roll up so i i said why don't we just have that 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 thing extends to like 15 feet that's a big win for us we don't gotta wait for ladders to come and i the purchase of it was a couple hundred bucks and we had money they were blowing money on stupid shit. They go blow $150, $200 on, on fucking clipboards for the traffic division so they can have magnifying glasses that light up so they could write their tickets. Like, what are we spending money on? Such dumb shit. They're buying extras for their friends. And I'm like, how'd you get one? Like, ah, you know, I'm friends with the traffic sergeant. He ordered me one too. So I'm like, what? Like, what the fuck is going on at this place? They're blowing money on stupid shit. So, you know, I can't emphasize enough that probably some of the motivation of this training company is to prepare for these things before they occur. Hence, Tom Stilson's joining us in in, in this because he's been through two OISs and uh, it's important to know these things. And I mean, just beyond that, both of those shootings uh, are very diametrically opposed. When you look at my first shooting, small agency, second shooting, much larger agency, you would assume that the larger agency would have been better prepared. And this isn't, I'm not going to name drop them or, or knock them uh, publicly. Uh, these are, there's imperfections in everything that we do. And there's some things that we do very well. But when you look at both of those two agencies and how they handled it, they were very, very different. Um, one of the major things I noticed was just how impersonal the first one, or sorry, excuse me, how impersonal the, fir- the second one was versus the first one, my sheriff walked up to me and gave me a hug and goes, Tommy, I'm glad you're okay. And that was something for me that it meant a lot of value. I'm not saying that every sheriff or chief needs to go up and hug one of their guys or gals that's been in the shooting. But to know that that empathy was there, that that care and that appreciation was there. Whereas on my second one, I had a commander that stood there and he's holding his cup of coffee and he looks at me and goes, still are you okay? Yes, sir. And he goes, okay. And just turns around and walks away. Most impersonal, uh, no compassion, no empathy or anything like that. And that's a common theme. Um, Beyond having been in two officer-involved shootings, I've talked with dozens, if not probably close to 100 other officers that have been in shootings. And the common theme that we see throughout these, um, there's trauma that's associated with the event itself, the the ambush, um, getting shot, getting wounded, these sort of things. But on the flip side, most of the stressors that I hear from other officers are as a result of command staff, coworkers, media, the public, the prosecutor's office, their city council, the list goes on and on from people who, well, I would have killed that son of a bitch. I know exactly, you know, if I'd been there, I know what I would have done. Um, all the way to your command staff not showing any level of support, not showing any level of appreciation for what the difficult decision and choice that you had to make to go through that. And and that's a big part of what we're trying to change with this class is if we can get command staff as well as the fellow officer or deputy to better understand what it is to go through one of these, we're going to be able to handle these better and be better prepared and make sure that we're not destroying agencies and destroying good cops by not giving them the support that they need. Seems to make a ton of sense. And especially where you guys are in that area, 
and in certain parts of the country, it's much more prevalent. The likelihood of somebody being in a police involved shooting, it, it's exponentially higher. Arizona, California, mm-hmm. Texas. Uh, I wonder what the correlation, the only correlation I come up with right off the top of my head is the weather. So we know <laughs> that when the weather is nice, I used to tell people when they were new at the police department, if you see the bugs come out, that means all the bugs come out. So if you come to work and it's that first spring day, it's your first day back after you know your days off. Understand that if you are seeing uh, the spring arising, that means every critter, every bad guy has now woken up as well and is now coming outside. So we get away with it, I think, here a lot in the Northeast because it's typically much colder throughout the winter. But once that summer hits, and that's the only correlation I can imagine is because it's always warm in Texas. It's always warm in California and Arizona. So they've got Florida, right? They have, oh my God, the OIS is in Florida. They're shooting nonstop there. I think you're the most cops killed Florida, Texas, and California. That's got to be a real thing. I would, And that's just me presuming. But, sure. you know, so it certainly is something that people really need to consider is, one, if you're a command staff listening to this, understanding what your role is. And then two, if you actually are the OIS uh, or involved in the OIS, your officer in that, you know, knowing what the procedures or what feelings you're going to go through that you may not anticipate um, prior to having been in a officer involved shooting. There's not an easy way to say that this is exactly what you're going to experience when you go through an officer involved shooting. There's, there's no canned way of saying it. Um, I do compare it to a getting hit with a fire hose. You can watch somebody get hit by a fire hose and go, oh, shit, that had to hurt. But until you're on the receiving end of that, you don't really know what that's like. And that simple, it's an oversimplified explanation of what it means to be in an officer-involved shooting. But nevertheless, we tend to fantasize about what an officer-involved shooting is going to be like. And I don't mean that in the bad sense. We don't want to go get into a shooting. We don't want to go out and get shot at or have to shoot someone. But Jeff, you talk about this as the tactical fantasy. And I absolutely love that, that, that phrase, that reference. We all have this perception of how it's going to go. And I posted a meme in the group, uh, as usual with me and my memes, posted a meme in the group of what we think our shooting is going to be like, which is Tom Cruise from Collateral, Yo, Homie, is that my briefcase? And right. then we get out there and we're Tex Grebner, you know, I just fucking shot myself uh, getting stirruped uh, while you're on the shooting range shooting at a stationary target. And until we begin to address those shortcomings of our expectations of what we think a shooting is going to be like and become more realistic about what a shooting will be, what a shooting is actually like to go through. We're going to continue to deceive ourselves and our command staff is going to deceive themselves that we're prepared for what's going to be presented to us when we do go through a shooting. And most agencies are not, most of them don't have plans in place that are updated or even adequate to handle it. If they have a plan in place. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things I like about what Tom's putting out is, is that, you know, even an agency within itself can wildly, wildly vary from lieutenant to captain to chief about how they're going to handle something in, after an officer involved shooting. Um, you know, the first one that I, I wasn't, I didn't shoot anybody, but I was the first person on the scene of someone very close to me, an officer involved shooting. And that, that cop went through a lot of things. They took care of her pretty good at the police department, but there were just a lot of little things like the psychologist at the critical incident debrief, you know, he was a clown, you know, like when I was in there for my critical incident debrief, he was, wasn't going to let me leave the room until I cried to show some emotion. So little things like that. And what the one thing that we can control is preparing ourselves. And if we can really deep dive into the things that which we control and other, us, if I can prepare myself or if any other cop can prepare themselves and understand that which they're likely to incur in this kind of scenario, That's the best as individuals we can do. And as individuals, when we all prepare and we start coming together as teams and units and we become leaders and supervisors and agencies, then that preparation bleeds over and we have more of an institutional preparation as opposed to just a few guys that have done the work themselves and gals that have done the work themselves and some are prepared and some are not. So a class like Tom's puts more individual preparation out there, which leads to more institutional preparation down the road. Yeah, absolutely. And this is what's great about my class and then Jeff, your class of street survival is they really do juxtapose with each other. They, you're attacking the 
mindset, you're attacking the um, OODA loop, action reaction time, these sort of things. With my class, it ties in that same information and puts it more into that officer involved shooting context about how quickly it is, but also getting command staff, getting your fellow coworkers to understand that you may watch a, a body cam of one of your buddies during a critical incident, officer involved shooting, and you will look at him open fire on a suspect that's shooting at him, charging at him with a knife, and you'll see the suspect start to fall during the video. And I don't know how many times we've seen this where officers go, man, those last few shots were, seemed excessive. Why did he keep shooting? There's no reason for him to fire those last two or three. He was already falling down. But that shows a complete lack of understanding. And, and it's nothing that's I, – I, I, don't, I don't decry command staff or our fellow cops because they say that. They don't know any better. Nobody's taught them any better to understand right. that when we have that action reaction gap of, oh, we recognize the suspect as a threat. He's charging at me with a knife. He's pulling a gun out. Now I need to engage him with lethal force. That same time action versus reaction delay occurs towards the back end of it. And yet we have agencies, we have prosecutors that are actually charging cops because they continue to fire while the suspect's falling to the ground. And they say, well, that's excessive. And it shows that um, he shouldn't have been firing because, look, he's down. Well, that's why we get to sit here comfortably in a chair with with no external forces, no stress or anything like that. And we're able to decompose the, or, or decompress all of that information and go, oh, well, yeah, obviously that's excessive. Not understanding that action versus reaction gap and how that plays into it and how that ties into officer involved shootings and critical incidents. Yeah, and that's that's a perfect example. If you if you're in a position of leadership in law enforcement, that's the kind of stuff that you need to know about. You need to you need to understand that once when you're under extreme stress, once you commit yourself to an action, it takes a certain amount of time to put the brakes on that action. And if you're already pulling the trigger at someone who's a lethal threat and is threatening your life, it takes a while. It takes a while. And when I say a while, I mean half a second, couple seconds to put the brakes on that action that your mind is already committed to. If your mind says pull the trigger, you're going to pull the trigger until your mind says stop pulling the trigger. And it takes your mind a while to process the information that's coming to it. And those are the kind of things that command staff and leadership need to understand. And those are the kind of things that need to be considered when we when we put together officer involved shooting protocols at agencies and, and us as individual cops need to understand so that we can be better prepared because when we're better prepared on the front end, the consequences, both in our heads and in our hearts, are probably less likely to be severe to us afterwards. Absolutely. And I love my analogy, so I'll, I'll build off of Jeff's what Jeff said about pumping the brakes. And I, this, this ties in very well. If I'm working a, a ho-hum calls for service and even just a basic traffic stop, nothing's elevated. Everybody's being very cooperative. I'm that car that's cruising down a 35 mile an hour zone doing 35. And if a little kid jumps out in front of me and I've got to slam on my brakes, my stopping distance is shorter. But if I'm running code screaming, doing 100 miles an hour down that street, and that kid jumps out in front of me, it's going to take longer for me to stop. It's going to take longer for me to be able to get that car move. And sometimes that may mean I have to swerve out of the way, and I could crash. That's what we see when we go to an officer-involved shooting, or when we have an officer-involved shooting or a critical incident occur. The dynamics have completely changed. You're doing 100 miles an hour, and for you to stop or change course is going to have imperfect consequences. There's going to be things that are going to occur during that, that on its surface, we look at and go, ah, that, that, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. Well, policing, particularly during critical incidents and officer involved shootings, it's not pretty. A use of force is not pretty. Shooting another human being is not a pretty thing, but that's what we're expected to do as law enforcement officers. That's what we're expected to do. We don't, we're not given that gun and all these tools to look pretty in photos and hand out ice cream to kids. And I don't want to tear that down and make that look poor, but at the same time, we're given that gun to protect the community. We're given that gun to protect innocent people and to protect ourselves. And that may mean having to use force against another human being. It's not a pretty thing, but it's something that as law enforcement, we need to have an open conversation with ourselves, our coworkers, and also the public. That's a very critical thing that we tend to sugarcoat over a lot of times during these incidents. We have a great opportunity to really communicate to the public the, un, the the dirty underside, if you will, of what our job may have to entail to keep the public safe and to have that luxury of not having to worry in the back of your mind, am I going to get mugged? Am I going to get shot? Am I going to get attacked on my way to the store? Yeah. And that, you, you touched on it a little bit too. You talked about that tactical fantasy. You know, I, 
cops will a lot of times make that statement while they're sitting in Tommy tough guy land in their chair, watching what you did. And they'll make that statement. I would have just shot him. I would have done this or I would have done that, but they weren't there. They didn't smell the guy's breath. They didn't see the blood vein, the veins in the guy's eyes. They didn't see the blood pumping in his carotid artery. They didn't see the way he was breathing. We don't know because we weren't there, but you know, a lot of times those of us, and you know, I've done this, this is, I'm guilty of this myself. Uh, that uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Dunning Kruger effect, but really all it is, is people that have a low ability at a particular task tend to overestimate their ability at that particular task. And that is rampant sometimes in our profession, especially when it comes to firearms proficiency. A lot of people that say I'd have just shot them are the same ones that complain about having to go to the range for four hours, twice a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to look at how they perceive it for a lot of the command staff people. The Your officers will go to the range and we're shooting on a static range at a static target, stationary. Nobody's shooting back at us. There's no force on force. And we have to meet a minimum number. There's a lot of agencies that don't even require a time constraint on their qualifications. So there's no actual stress factor that's being added into that of just a little bit of pressure of you have to meet this particular amount of time. So we see agencies, but they do that because that's the minimum level that they need to do. But it's a low frequency, high risk event that we have to use a firearm in the course of our employment. On the flip side, you look at most agencies and what do they do annually or biannually, I would hope, and it's emergency vehicle operations, at least presentations. They go through and do pursuit driving, break and evade, Texas T, these sort of vehicle operations things. Why do they do that so frequently and so often with such intensity? Because that's our high risk, high frequency event that we do in law enforcement. We have to begin to train ourselves. And this is where actually going out on the range and practicing and then making your drills for your agency. That's the first step is making your agency actually encompass um, real training scenarios, actually applicable training to your firearms qualifications. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. Dennis, you were talking about this earlier. You can throw all this money at this stuff. And I mean, the stupid clipboards and all these little things when you can throw some extra money at some extra target stands. So now you can simulate a target moving towards you or away from you at an angle. And then you having to move and shoot at that target on a static range. You don't need a several thousand dollar system to simulate a moving target. You just need some creativity and ingenuity to do that. And you're going to prepare your officers better for actually uh, experiencing uh, the stresses and the environment of an officer involved shooting. Yeah. Rich Bruno, who's our new uh, firearms instructor here, um, is doing a very good job with working with very little to make some real good, real life feeling scenarios occur on a range. And yeah. I'm actually writing a bunch of notes. Rich will be in this afternoon. I have a lot of notes from listening to you guys about plans that I have to make things better. And that's what I do. I just make better things to make things better for everybody else. So uh, I couldn't agree more. And there's obviously this dynamic of where people are safety minded. Maybe there's a lack of resources, but you'd be surprised when you get a little creative. And I would urge everybody who is creative and come up with ideas that may not cost very much money or any money at all to at least propose them to your administrations, your police academies, your training division saying, hey, I saw this or I thought of this. This might be a good idea. And one of the ones I talk about, and hopefully people are listening to this who are in charge of academies, a simple one in the academy is how many of you were trained on how to do a foot pursuit in the academy? You had all this time to PT, but now one person ran you through a drill once or twice or 15 times, which you should get 15 times, of here's a radio, your drill instructor or your instructor is the dispatcher. You're going to have people come to the academy every day dressed differently. We'll take different looking people. We'll change the environments. We won't use the same one over and over again. And that could be going from parking lot A to parking lot C at a college campus where most police academies are done. Or we're going to go to the park today and we're going to, there's four open fields and there's houses. You just could pick these things out. And every week for the 15 to 24 to 30 weeks that you're in the academy, you're going to run a drill, an endurance drill, where you're going to give a foot pursuit. What does this cost? I mean, anybody in anywhere can find the resources to dig up. Hey, can we borrow a couple of radios for the academy? Every police department has 25, 30 extra radios. You can go to channel seven, which is a direct talk channel, stay off everything else. And you have extended the mics, have them put their, their, their belts on and you don't got to have guns. Just 
have, have just get used to the radio candor, simple stuff. So this way, when you have your first foot pursuit, you don't sound like a fucking lunatic and give everybody at the agency a complete heart attack where we can't stomach food anymore. And we just go to our cars and start. And by the way, if you're hearing things like that and you're more seasoned police officer, don't be afraid to get on the radio and say, who are you? Where are you? We don't know who you are. Tell us who you are. They may hear that. And we have had senior guys in pursuits. I've heard them. Uh, I'm in a pursuit. Who are you? You're here 17 years. I know you haven't been in many pursuits, but who the fuck are you, dude? And where are we failing to get these people this training? We do this semi-annual training or these, these biannual trainings, whatever you want to call it. I think semi-annual and biannual, same thing. Um, what are we What are we getting accomplished here? Even the stuff that we have to do. I look at this. I'm, this is where my wheels are turning nonstop. I get you got to do CPR. I get you got to do this. I get you got to do that. I get you got to do domestic violence. Let's make it better. Let's not make it so like we're just like, oh, my God. Click, right? I got to show up. This is brutal. Like, how can we make this better for everybody? And why are we just covering how to do CPR when police officers respond to what? Every fucking medical call there is. So great. CPR is important. What people don't realize is like rescue breathing is significantly more important than CPR. Uh, A choking victim is probably more important than CPR. People think people are resuscitated with CPR. You know, you realize the statistical data on us or human beings saving another human being with, with cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's almost like nothing. Like it's what they've discovered is most people aren't dead when they're given CPR. Because yeah. cops aren't, they're pumped up. You're not using your right fingers. You're not really getting in there for the pulse and making sure there's no breathing, no pulse. So they start doing CPR. The person's never dead. They still got a heart rate. They're just having shallow breathing. So one of those things to recognize, here's some simple stuff. I watch guys do this. And I think in my head, how many people die a year because these fucking cops? And it's not even their fault, right? But it, it, it comes down to like, where is the conversation of what rescue breathing looks like? You know, well, it's just, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's amazing. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we see is overdoses. That's what yeah, we that's right. constantly. Say, you took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. It, right. It, you ever pump air into, a, into an overdose victim? Like, literally, they go from purple to white in about 30 seconds. They go back or whatever. If you were black, you could, you could see the color of the skin change by just giving them air. I mean, I could sit there and resuscitate or keep a... I, we didn't have Narcan when I left. Right? Nobody had Narcan. So I would sit there and just pump people waiting for the paramedics. The only ones had Narcan. And I'm like, we're good. She'll be... She's going to make it. Think about it today. You got you got people that are high on on Fireball and Jameson's getting Narcan because Narcan is the answer to everything. Now, if you so much as look like you might be a drug addict or a, having an overdose moment, you're getting Narcan these days, whether it works or not. And to go back, you know, to what you were talking about, biannual or some annual firearms training. That's not training. Hmm. When you show up and you shoot a hundred rounds at a target that doesn't move. And you're using the same course of fire that you used for the last 17 years. And you're just like you said, Dennis, like, oh, I got to be here. And I like to shoot. I like firearms training. But, you know, when we went to the range for our annual firearms training up until the last couple of years, what we did was we fucked around for six hours. We shot a daylight qual, a nighttime qual. We shot the long gun and we went home and there was no training involved because and there's no retention in that skill doing that once or twice a year. You don't retain retain that because you, you guys think about it. Every time you went to the range, the worst shooters were the same damn guys every time. Why? Because that's not training. That's just liability prevention is all it is. You know, well, you gotta say they did something. Okay. And it's it's amazing yeah. when we got it when we had a handgun sh- uh, ammunition shortage that all of a sudden the qualifications moved down to once a year. Mm-hmm. They cannot find the handgun. So there's a lot of there's a lot of solutions to a lot of these issues. And again, I'm not somebody, I'll say this over and over again. I'm not somebody who's just sitting here bitching and complaining. We're fucking doing something about it. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna do something. Whether you like to hear it or not, whether you're somebody who agrees with what we have to say, we're not here for you. If you if you like what we have to say, this is who we are. We appreciate your support. We need your support. And it's it, I'm telling you, after an episode like this, I'll get like a director from police academy. He's like, "Yo, we want to unfuck this shit. Like, how you help us?" And it's my job to try to figure out how do I do that faster because I have. Uh, I should put a picture up on on Instagram. I literally took the notes out of my phone and transcribed them to a. I'm guessing a four foot by three foot whiteboard, and I'm still not done writing what my to dos are. You love those so I go whiteboards. To that board and I have to have them, dude. Like, I literally, you know, what I think about what's that movie, A Beautiful Mind, where the guy's just mm-hmm. like writing crazy shit all over yep. the place. 
I can't emphasize to you. I'm literally writing notes about other things I have to do because I got to get them out of my fucking brain today. And I got to hand them off so I can get down to the work that needs to get done to make all of this shit better. And that's my, that's my role now is, okay, I get what's wrong. We're trying to address what's right. And it's little by little, day by day, brick by brick, this thing will get better. And what's the option? Just not do anything. Like nothing's been done for a long time. And others have attempted it. Some people have put some serious dents and have have really contributed to a lot of training and changed things for the better. But there hasn't been much. There has not been much movement. And it's not, it can't be everybody who can have the ability to make the change. And that's a it's a very audacious thing to say. But as I sit here, I come up with some phenomenal ideas. The question I have for myself at times is, how come nobody ever thought of this? How come nobody else ever thought of this? And I'm not in an environment anymore where I can make a suggestion and just get shot down because that's the way we ever, we ever did it. Here's another one. How about this one? I used to, I told we had a, a captain in radio and in communications division, big agency, right? And I said, hey, you know, when we're on these stops with these people and they have warrants, our dispatch tends to go, uh, five he has a warrant out of so and so for a thousand. He's got one out of here for five hundred, and they're sitting there listening to that. And he goes, "Yeah, I know it's a, a problem." I go, "So why don't we just have a code that says like, if I've got a 10, 10 12, or I don't know what the fuck, like I don't even know code 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 sixty three. All right, thank you. And you learn to like not make it so obvious. Just hey, let me get a second to get something in my car real fast. All right, go ahead, go with that information. Now I'm in the clear, and. He goes, that's a really good idea. And two weeks later, I'm like, are we going to go forward with this at all? Because they're still doing it. He's like, nah, we're used to doing it this way. That's cool. So we'll just get shot in the fucking face because they know they're going to jail. Like, it is no different than telling somebody while they sit in a car and control and arms reach for a weapon that we're going to take law enforcement action. If you're going to do something, here is the jump on me tactically. But it's just why all I can do is Tom and Jeff is take the information and put it out there and say, hey, we think this might be a better idea. Yeah, you could take yeah. it or you could not take it. And if you take it and you use it, great. Uh, wh- here, I made this. I want you to have it. It would have been a sin if I would have kept it to myself. And hopefully it'll save somebody's life. That's Absolutely. why That's why Tom's class is so important. I mean, Tom, what, what, what would you say in your, in your experience gathering information and doing research for your class is the most woefully inadequate yeah part of preparing cops for officer involved shootings is it the physical execution of the training or is it having self-awareness about the emotional effects or what, what, where, do, where do you think that falls that is so i said earlier officer involved shootings are highly complex there are there's not a simple answer to it but to try and summarize it at the most underprepared it's cognitive dissonance Mm. It's it's the that is the number one thing that law enforcement, command staff, uh, the public media, it doesn't matter who we live in this world where we think that because it hasn't happened to me yet, my tactics are sound. My plan is sound. Everything is working perfectly fine for me because it hasn't happened to me yet. I've made a thousand traffic stops and I've never had a guy take off from me on a traffic stop. I've never had a guy try and pull a gun on me on a traffic stop. Oh, I've always made it a pro. I I use this as an example. I've been to this house 20, 30 times for domestic assault or domestic disturbance. I go to that house. I make the, I park in the same spot, two houses north of up the street. I walk up, I contact Joe Crackhead, Jane Crackhead, and do my investigation. And we go from there. Somebody goes to jail. Somebody doesn't go to jail. And we leave it at that. But the problem is, is after doing that 20 or 30 times, Jane Crackhead, Joe Crackhead knows exactly what my tactics are. If I don't change my tactics up, if I don't change my approach, if I never challenge myself mentally to go, shit, what if Joe Crackhead got a hold of Uncle Bubba's AR-15 and today's the day that he's tired of the cops messing with him. He's tired of the cops showing up to the house and he figures he'll just go ahead and shoot at the cops. Now you're in a scenario you never presented and you never considered. And it's not looking at it from the fantasy of, well, I'm going to roll up there. I'm going to strut up. And when I see him present the rifle, I'm just going to shoot him. That's not realistic. That's a tactical fantasy, Jeff, that you talk about. It's that we have this expectation that because I'm the police, I'm untouchable because it hasn't happened to me. It won't happen to me until we start critically assessing everything that we do in our tactics, our mindset, we're going to fail. We're going to have shortcomings. We're going to be unprepared for a lot of different things. And that's not just that officer that was involved. That's that commander. 
I talked with a, a, a officer that we're good friends with. Uh, he's one of the other ones that does memes for us. He works for an over 2000 officer agency on the East coast. And he told me the last time they had an officer involved shooting was 10 years ago. And they have no fucking clue what their policy is on it. They don't have anything. They have no idea. And I get, I've had phone calls from chiefs. I've had phone calls from deputies that were involved in shootings and they go, we didn't know what to do. We haven't had one in five years, 10 years, 15 years. Nobody here at the agency has been involved in one. So when we get to this, we're suddenly inadequate and we're not prepared for it. But it was because they went through day-to-day operations, figuring this is the norm. It won't happen to us. It's not going to happen to us until it happens to them. And some of them are facing horrible circumstances where an officer was wounded or killed and they're not providing that support. And there's agencies, there's commanders and staff that may look at that and go, well, yeah, no, 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 I'm I'm prepared for it. I'm prepared for it. We'll handle it. What, What plans have you put in place? How are you going to communicate that? How are you going to investigate that? What agency is going to investigate that? How are you going to handle the internal? Are you going to be providing that support for that officer or deputy that was involved in that, that trooper that was involved in that? And when we say providing support, it's not just, oh, hey, you know, we're going to have you go talk to the department psychiatrist uh, before you go back to work and we're going to make sure you're okay. That's horseshit. I've been through five different psyche valves. Uh, amazingly, I passed all of them <laughs> as warped and twisted as I am. But I'd like amazingly- to appeal those decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where can I write a letter to? Because I can get that. <laughs> my my <laughs> wife was like, "How in the fuck did you pass those?" But it, the problem is, is that that again, that goes back to that liability reduction for the agency. The agency is just trying to say, "Look, see, we ran you through a psyche valve. Yep. You're not crazy. You're not going to eat your own gun, and you're not going to go out and start tuning people up when you get on the street." That's not true support. True support comes from your upper command giving you a phone call showing up and having a face-to-face meeting with you, checking in with you. I've known uh, leaders that have gone out and had a beer with their guys. Hey, I want to make sure you're okay. I've been through shit like this. And then they talk about it. Talking about this stuff is one of the best things you can possibly do. But to tie back into this, these the importance of having that support, the importance of that peer support, you have to understand that officer is going to come back from that administrative leave one day. And he or she's going to go back out in the street and they're going to go out and work calls for service. And they're going to be talking with their buddies and they're going to ask them, you know, how, how are things? How are you doing? We're going to, we're going to talk shop. And what do we do as cops? We bitch. One of, that's one of the best things that we can do is we complain. And if our command staff was absent and all they did was just check the present button, like, oh yeah, I showed up. I was there. I, I talked to him for a couple of minutes and then I left and you're not actively supporting him. You will watch officers become disgruntled angry about how their agency handled it. And if that's one time that you can make or break an agency, you can either see that agency's morale go through the roof and they will go through hell in a gasoline suit for you. Show that support. But if you want to see on the flip side where an agency will crumple, your retention will go down. You will see officers disgruntled, retiring early, and your your recruitment numbers go down because word of mouth is so critical in this profession about, Hey, is this a good agency? We see it on the group all the time. Hey, I'm looking for a good agency down in this area. Who would you recommend? Who would you not recommend? You want to see those numbers go down, your recruitment and retention go down. Don't be prepared for these things. Don't take those extra steps in that time, because that is, that is really when our, we're, we're tested as who we are in leadership, as who we are as cops, who we are as peers. Yeah. I, you make some really good points there. You talk about how you know, it's never happened at a particular place. You go to a certain call over and over and over again. We build almost these Pavlovian responses to these calls we go to. You know, the 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 dog food doesn't come out when we expect it to one day, and uh, we're we're in the middle of a of a of a tornado of emotion and injuries and critical incidents because we've done the same thing over and over and over again. We always say there's nothing routine about police work, but there are routines within this job that can kill you. Because comfort breeds complacency and complacency breeds danger, whether it's policy driven or whether it's tactically driven out on the streets by the bad guy. And one of the things I don't think we do enough is when when a cop gets injured or a cop gets attacked or assaulted. We forget that we're victims of a crime. I mean, we when a guy tries to shoot a police officer, that police officer is the victim of an attempted murder. Someone tried to murder that cop, and we don't look at that cop like the victim of a crime. 
we tend to, as an industry, as a profession, we're guilty until IA or OPS or whatever you call it at your particular police department comes in and proves you innocent, right down to the fact, you know, because just the evidence collection, taking your uniform, taking your pistol, you know, do they do little things like give you another pistol when they take your pistol away from you? What's your payroll code? Does it say suspended with pay? Because suspended is a bad thing. You know, little stuff like that becomes very important to cops that get involved in these critical incidents, shootings, whether whether it's a shooting or something else. But that's very important to cops. And for some reason, com- uh, as an industry, we tend to look down on coddling cops. And that's not really coddling cops. I guess that's a terrible choice of words, but treating cops like they're a victim of a crime. We don't do well, that enough. I'll, I'll drive a Tom. I'll, I'll take a page from Tom Rizzo uh, on this. And I absolutely love it. We demand that we present empathy and compassion to everybody that we come into contact in this profession. Mm-hmm. And I do not disagree with that. Uh, we know from how we interview and we communicate with people, and we talk about this in the interdiction game uh, and, and, and interviewing people, these sort of things, that that professionalism, that compassion, that empathy, all the way from the 80-year-old lady that was mugged and had her purse stolen at gunpoint, all the way to that absolute scum of the earth child molester that I have to sit across from and show some level of kind of empathy to be able to get a confession from him. We're expected to do that. Yet one of the most tragic things that we do in this profession is we don't extend it to our fellow cops. And I get that we're a lot of type A people, and I'm not saying that we all need to hug it out and stuff like that. But on the flip side, we're still human beings. We're not robots. We have compassion. We have feelings. We have uh, beliefs. We have implicit bias built into us, not in the in the racial sense, but we have these biases that are built into us of what we expect an interaction should go with, with another person or officer safety tactics, but also how our command and our coworkers should treat us after such an event. And when we don't get that support, what do we end up facing? We end up facing an empty abyss that we'll see officers get lost. I've seen officers get DWIs. They've cheated on their spouses, uh, domestic assault, they lose their jobs, uh, pill addiction, you name it. The list just goes on and on and on. And I'm not sitting here saying that I'm perfect, but I've been through that. I've had to fight those demons and fight those battles. And it makes it a hell of a lot easier when you have people that you work with that are going to support you and show that same level of empathy and compassion that is demanded that you show the people that you interact with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. We don't, we don't do that enough. I mean, Right down to this little interactions between cops. You know, Dennis and I were talking about busting each other's balls at the beginning, but, you know, our friend Garrett uh, says there's two things that cops hate or that cops hate change and the way things are. And we tend to bitch so much that like sometimes even just in the comments in our Facebook groups, some of us have to go in and turn off the comments in some of these Facebook groups because guys want to start getting venomous with each other and telling, yeah, yeah, I, I've turned, I turned off uh, a, conversation in one of my posts the other day because we're guys I mean, you pretty much to... turn off everybody you meet so yeah right i have that i have that i have oh, that no, just, just, just still got it he's got that dad body so <laughs> Pe- some people are into that believe it or not thank goodness <laughs> yeah I, i'm dying to meet one of those people <laughs> um so well we don't I do that i'm just I, i'm just razzing you a little bit because I, I know i know we don't but we don't do that we don't we, we don't, don't have enough, enough compassion for each other What's that? Jeffrey, you and I don't hug enough. I just, I just realized. I'm, af- I'm afraid, Dennis. Of what? I'm afraid that it will just. I'm afraid un- I'm going to break a bone in your brittle old body. I'm afraid this is going to unleash your passion for me and things are going to go downhill from there. Don't be afraid. Embrace your feelings, my <laughs> friend. It's, it's 2022. Just give us some fiber beforehand and you'll be good to go. <laughs> now, now we're getting absolutely. <laughs> you are starting to see the other side of Tom yeah. Stilson. Well, I mean, you, you motherfuckers wait till you're 53 years old. We'll see. <laughs> oh, I, I'm you, still waiting there. Challenge accepted, my friends. We will see. I'm thankful well, every day for what I have left and how I'm where my life is at 53. Could be a lot worse. That's for sure. Yeah. Could be a lot better. too. Come no. on. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm what, one of the. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, one of the great things I think about this profession is just like we were doing here was we will absolutely fucking roast each other. Um, that, that, that's a beautiful thing. Our sense of humor is something I think that's so undervalued within this profession. We, we have a great sense of humor. We have a dark sense of humor. 
And with that sense of humor, you can get through a lot of different things. And I think what a lot of officers aren't prepared for, what I, for as savage as I can be on, on giving myself and other people a hard time, what I wasn't prepared for was literally two days out of the shooting, some guy coming up and giving me shit about shooting a picket fence uh, during the shooting. Like, you know, you shot the fence more times than you shot the suspect. And That's I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's fucked up, but I, there, in, I, there's stories. There was a story, I think it was down in Florida a few years back where a officer um, responded to a armed subject with a shotgun. Turned out it was like the 70 some year old guy in a wheelchair and officer gets there. Guy won't drop the shotgun. He spins around. I think he cranks around off of the shotgun. So the officer has to shoot him. Absolutely. hundred percent justified. Is it shitty? I mean, we don't wake up every day thinking like, Oh, I'm going to have to shoot somebody in a wheelchair. We don't think necessarily that who we're going to encounter is that person. That's, that's a whole mindset thing that I cover in my class about what we may encounter. And that's a different, different or more extensive discussion for another time. But he comes back from his leaf, and at their first firearm calls, the range master there comes up with a freaking wheelchair and puts the target in a wheelchair at their range qualification. I, I mean, that's, that's a whole level of uh. fucked up. You got to know your audience. And I'm not advocating for that. I'm not saying that's the thing to do, but as cops, we have that dark sense of humor and that's how we address that's a lot funny. of this stuff. And I, you know, it's messed up. It's funny, but on the flip side too, if you don't know that cop very well, how, how do you think he's going to handle that? He may laugh hourly at that, but on the inside, he's like, you motherfucker. Like I do, I'm still, I'm losing sleep over the fact that I had to kill somebody who looked like my grandpa. Um, mm-hmm. That's, we have to keep that in consideration. And again, it's not having to walk on eggshells worried about that. Oh man, is Tom going to twist off if I make fun of him on that guys on my squad uh, give me a hard time about the fact that I've been in two shootings, but both of them have lit. I'm grateful that both of them have lived. Uh, frankly, I mean, it was, there were interventions, if you will, during that, that they're not dead. And when you look back at it, it's, it's science and pure chance that that's how it went. But even then, um, if they had died and I was still getting made fun of or given a hard time about those things, about how they transpired, if I'm not mentally prepared for that, that's going to tear me down. It, it's not going to build me up. And we have to find bigger and better coping mechanisms outside of our sense of humor with these things. Uh, One of the biggest things is we talk about post-traumatic stress, PTSD, and how that affects us after the fact. But we don't talk as much about post-traumatic growth. When you go through a traumatic incident, we tend to look at it as the bad thing. Um, whenever Whenever I've gone through any of my critical incidents, any of my shootings, any of these things I've been through, the biggest thing I have to take a step back from is what did I do well? What did I not do well? And how do I fix and improve what I didn't do well? How do I apply that for future applications in my career? And if I don't look at those things critically, I won't improve myself. So then the next time I roll up on a scene and I've got a young pup there and I see he's employing something that nearly got me killed, I can go, hey, man, look, look address it there on scene. And then after the fact, pull him aside and go, hey, do you see what I saw there, why I did that, why I addressed that, hold him accountable, hold myself accountable, not for getting in trouble, but for coming home alive at the end of the day, making sure that we're improving our tactics and our ability on these things. And that's where this growth comes from that. One of the biggest things for me that has been cathartic and therapeutic throughout this whole process is that I've been able to tell my story. I've been able to tell other cops stories that have been through horrific shit that I would never want to see myself or anybody else go through. But because we can tell that story and those experiences and the lessons learned from that, maybe I'll get a phone call one day from another cop going, hey, man, I took your class. I heard you talk about this and I'm alive today as an instructor, as somebody who teaches. And I would hope to be seen as a mentor and a leader to other cops. There's no greater feeling in the world than that. There's no better high than than knowing that you shared information and a cop is alive and not hurt or somebody innocent is alive and not hurt because we employed sound tactics. We had the right mindset going into this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a quote guy. I love great quotes and I love great quotes because great quotes stimulate thought. And when you, when your thought is stimulated, your mind is open and there's two really good ones. The first one is a, is a Grossman quote and I don't remember it verbatim, but basically says, don't expect the combat fairy to come in in your toughest moments and bonk you on the head with the combat one and magically make you able to do things that you've never trained for or rehearsed prior to this moment. And that's the same, not just with combat, with physical tactics, but it's the same with everything in law enforcement, like preparing for an OIS. If you're 
not prepared for it physically, mentally, technically, then it may affect the outcome with either fatal with a, with a fatal consequence. And another great quote that I love is from a guy named Sid Hill. He was a, he retired from LA Sheriff's Department. He wrote a couple of books. He said, we dishonor the fallen if we don't learn from the mistakes that could have saved them. And I like to apply that to an even broader thing, not, not just for officers that were killed in the line of duty, but everything we do, everything we do is a learning opportunity. And every day we our Instagrams and our Facebook feeds are just filled with uh, learning opportunities, things that have happened to other police officers. And I, I think if we're not creating these data points and putting them out there for people to recognize and open and open their minds and go, aha, and maybe give somebody that aha, mo- aha moment, then we're failing as trainers. So absolutely, Boys, I'm going to jump in here and say this has been one of the most profound and wonderful podcast episodes. And let's not get all of it out now. Let's save it for another episode. And I just want to thank the street cop community, the law enforcement community, and those who support the men and women in blue who are listening to this podcast. We appreciate you tremendously. In closing, is there anything else that you guys want to contribute within the next 60 to 90 seconds? This opportunity that that you guys have given me uh, is something that I don't want to squander. I don't want to see another cop have to go to through the experiences that I did and not come out better, not come out stronger. And this isn't just for cops that have been in a shooting. This isn't just for cops that are worried they may go through a shooting. This is for cops who are in that leadership role, who have to provide that support for our fellow coworker who's been through one. This is for that coworker who goes, man, I, you know, John's, John was through a shooting a couple of years ago, but I'm starting to see some problems and stuff with him here. What do I do? How do I go through and understand his position, her position, and, and make sure that that support? We're a community. We're a very strong community. And as that community within the thin blue line, it's, we have a duty to take care of each other. And the information that I want to present with this class that I do put out there it is with that goal that we do better for ourselves, we do better for each other, and we make sure that those numbers for cops that are getting into shootings, cops that are getting hurt, getting killed, having to leave the profession because of their experiences, those numbers go down. And the numbers of cops that can go through and find that same childlike enjoyment of what they had when they first started this job, and they can maintain that throughout their career. That's the goal here. I want you to be just as excited on day 900 as you were on day one, even after you've gone through all this shit and finding those resources and the ability to do that. That's where this is going to start. Yeah, absolutely. My final thought is just this, keep an open mind. When we close our minds and we stop learning, we stagnate, we become irrelevant. And when we become irrelevant, we are the ones that suffer because of our own irrelevance, not from us as individuals, but us as a profession. And sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And the way to prevent that is to keep an open mind, to always be learning. And when there's a learning opportunity, take it. Period. Jeff, you're very smart. All right. Well, what else have I got? (laughs) Jeff (laughs) Zoo. Self-deprecation. Self-deprecation. That's a good one. I have to have that. It helps. It's a coping mechanism. Exactly. It is. (laughs) Yeah, actually, it's not very often that I feel like I am um, certainly maybe not the most intelligent one in the room, especially after hearing that you went to Stanford, which I didn't know. I know, right? So I'm like, oh, great. He's smarter than me. What is it you guys say? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I do It's funny. Anyway, uh, you know, it's great having you guys here. And uh, if you want to check out either of these two gentlemen's classes, streetcop.com is where you can find them. Tom Stilson, Jeff Smith, Street Academy. Tom, what's the name of your classic? And I don't want to jargon it. No, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Officer involved, preparing for before, during, and after. So a bit of a mouthful, but it gets the point across. Who named that class, by the way? It sounds cool. I think it was uh, I think it was a it's collaborative me. effort between you. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll dump it on Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to give Dan the, Dan, the, Dan the luxury of it. <laughs> It's like the uh, it's like the the donation to the nursing home. You give it to him. Who cares? Right? Yeah, Dennis, like, the name Dennis came up with is something like "Don't be a menace to society while drinking your juice in the hood" or some shit like that. <laughs> and on that note, him swinging and missing with that completely, we will end this. And it's a pleasure seeing everybody and to a, a great future of changing lives and making this thing better. Pleasure as well. Thank you. See you guys.